If you need to take additional time now to write your stickies, remember the challenge was to have a minimum of four, as well as on a separate sticky, and I will go back here a slide. If you noticed that there was a lack of a particular component that you would have liked to have seen, maybe added to this project to make it more authentic, to make it more relevant, to make it more complex, you can do that as well. So take as much time as you need to do that. And once you are finished, you will see that there are pieces of chart paper around the room. And those chart um, pieces of chart paper have headings on them. So once you're finished with your sticky notes, what I would like you to do is to get up and try to match a sticky to a particular piece of chart paper. And if you would, that final sticky note, the additional component sticky note, we'll just stick those up in the front um, wall there on the, the left-hand side of the screen. That'll be fine. So there are four here and there are four here. So there's a total of eight. All right, are we done with putting our, our sticky notes up? Do you want significant content, or do you want one of the ones you straddled over there? <laughs> You're going to end up with a group of three, because you threw off my numbers. <laughs> okay. And you two ladies, you're going to get 21st century. I'm going to give you ladies a critique and feedback. Okay. If kids who try to shoot them off. The question was asked of me, so where did you come up with these um, different headings? And I can't lay claim to these specific headings. Um, these were developed by the Buck Institute for Education. Have any of you ever he heard of the Buck Institute? OK. Yes. I am one of the national faculty members for the Buck Institute for Education. So I've worked with them for about five years. Um, I'm not employed by them. I'm just a, a contract 1099 person. I say yes when I want to say yes, and I say no when I want to say no. It's a beautiful thing to be able to do that. Um, but at any rate, so the boys in the back room that I like to call them, um, after years and years of um, research and experience, they've come up with these eight essential elements of project-based learning. That's what they call them, the essential elements. And when I first was really introduced to project-based learning, I said, hey, wait, I'm doing stuff like that in my classroom. But really, I need to work on this a little bit. Oh, that element, yeah, I need to get better at that. So what I think you're going to find is this. One, you're going to say, oh, Dana, that piece. Been there, done that, do that all the time. And you might say, ooh, that one, that's something I need to think about. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these eight essential elements. But again, rather than having me talk at you about these elements, we're going to use this strategy where we are <laughs> pulling together already part of what you've done here with your aha moments. So you can do that in your classroom anytime you show your kids a short little video clip, have them do the aha moments, come up with your own headings. But now we're going to tie that into something called claim, evidence, and reasoning. So for you science folks, this is probably pretty familiar. Mm -hmm. Yes? 
Here's how it's going to work. What we want first and foremost is our claim. Our claim is going to be the definition. So we want the definition of what that element is. So if you have public audience, what and how would we define public audience? In order to help you with that definition, and some of them may be a little bit more obvious than others, but if we go back to my wiki page where it says project design and we click on that article that says eight essential elements article, it's an article that I wrote about those eight essential elements that walks you through a particular project. So you don't need to read the entire article now. You can save that for when you can't sleep tonight. But what you will need to do is kind of hone in on the section of the article that talks about your particular element. So that's going to help you with the claim. The next piece is the examples from the video, which becomes our evidence. Some of you have fewer stickies than others, and that's OK. Um, obviously, I left out driving question here. We only had one sticky there. It's all right. I'll talk about driving question. We'll revisit, actually, driving question from last time. And then I'll talk about the need to know. Some of you have a lot of stickies, and you might look at these stickies and you say, you know what, I don't think this one fits. Or we had a, we had a straddler one for one of our stickies. But if you don't think that it fits, that's OK. Don't include that. But as you're reading about the element, you might say, oh, wait, I remember seeing in the video as part of the evidence, as part of the example, but nobody put that on as a sticky. And you can certainly include that as well. And from the evidence, then we want to talk about reasoning. So how does this element actually function in the context of helping to promote student ownership and also that deeper understanding of the content. How does it help with student ownership? How does it promote a deeper understanding? So that's our claim, our evidence, and our reasoning. And then finally, I would like you to talk about your current practice. What am I currently doing in my classroom that reflects this element? And maybe on the level of complexity with that element, you're, you're at that elementary level, or maybe you're at the advanced level, and it's OK. But what are you doing currently in your classroom that reflects some critique and feedback, that reflects some of our 21st century skills and competencies? So that's the last component there. Claim, it's our definition using the article that we pulled up earlier to help you with that. The evidence, what did we see from the video? The reasoning, how does it promote a deeper understanding of the content? And how does it also give us better stu student ownership in the project? And then what is your current practice, and how is that reflective of the element? So I will grab some arcers, and I will pass those out. Because what I would like to do then is have some finished posters that we can see each of these components that we'll put back up um, that we can refer to. So if you need to move and spread out, we have plenty of empty tables. I feel like I'm just doing this big L shape dance um, this evening. So it should be split up that everybody has a partner with whom they are able to work. And do any of you have clarifying questions? We just pick a partner and go with that one. We're partners? Yeah, that's fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these eight essential elements. We're going to go through the process of what these eight essential elements look like in project-based learning. And then I'm also going to chat with you a little bit about an additional example within each element to give you um, more of a foundation than just the example that we looked at. Yes, ma'am. Do we get your slides, or is it on us to kind of take our own notes? So what we have is a couple of things. Um, first and foremost, I've got all of this on that page. Okay on the review, number one. Um, two, on the, is it the My Tomorrow site? I'm going to have to double check that. So there's a gentleman who is responsible for uploading content. Okay. And then the video is also available for all of this. Oh, yeah. OK? Cool. Yeah. Significant content. Guess what? Yes. You're up, because that's just what comes up first in the slides. So tell us a little bit about significant content. What's the definition? What did we see in the video? 
Um, why do we need to have this, and what are we doing currently that reflects it? The, the definition of the claim of significant content that we came up with after looking at the article um, was that it's natural curricular connections between what you want to accomplish. So I, I used the word in school, but that's only because I use curricular elsewhere. <laughs> um, but it's just the natural connections between what you want to do and the curriculum. Um, and this, this video, the evidence was, uh, they, they flat out stated that there were the connections between art, social studies, language arts, and tech. And then um, if you look a little further into it, there was the connection with the persuasion piece that needs to be done in language arts. And I don't think that was focused on enough. Um, and then the use of the Google technology. Um, if you offer um, technology at your school, I thought it was really cool that they actually tied into Google and made that walking city tour or whatever. And my question about that, though, was if there were 80 kids doing this, then are there 80, kid, 80 things to read for each public work? So with the walking tour piece, they worked in smaller groups to create the walking tours. Um, they did not have 80 separate walking tours, but they did have 80 separate kinetic sculptures, oh, and they had 80 separate persuasive pieces but then when as you well. Group updated Google Docs, mm -hmm. doesn't Google Docs store every update so that if I went into that now, I would see however with many With the Google walking tour? Yeah. So each, each group, from my understanding of this, each group was responsible for a particular um, sculpture that was already there. And they worked in smaller groups with that. And then collaboratively, they took those small groups to create one cohesive walking tour. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the reasoning that we looked at was that it just promoted, they promoted ownership and understanding with the sculpture. And then the letter to the community member to the install mayor. it, the mayor, to install the sculptures. And then the current practices that we discussed, um, we do lots of hands-on uh, in our classes at Schroeder. Um, modeling, presentations, critique, displays, but nothing on that scale. Mm -hmm. okay. So with that significant content, there's a couple of um, key pieces that I want to note here. First and foremost, when you're deciding on your project, it has to go back to the content. Then if it's not going back to the content, you're, you're just wasting your time because there are lots of feel good projects that you could do. And most of those are service learning projects. I feel good. I've given back to the community, pat myself on the back. But when I look at that project, what it, the curriculum really has been lost. Or the curricular <coughs> connections are so far stretched that I'm saying, how are you spending all this time on a project? So what I do when I'm deciding on a project, I, I do it by unit, first and foremost. And I say, what are, what are those natural connections within my curriculum? How can I create some sort of thematic connection with them? And if I can, I want to make connections to other disciplines. Sometimes I don't, not all the time. But if I can, I certainly want to do that because we're not in siloed subjects in the world in which we live. My rule of thumb is this. If I'm going to teach something in a very traditional manner, I can't go above and beyond 10% of the time that it would take me to teach it traditionally. Otherwise, I am not going to have enough time to ensure that all of my content is included within my course. And in some cases, what has happened, that in turning it into a project, it actually takes less time than it would to do it traditionally. For example, I did a war and conflict unit. The longest <coughs> project I ever did, war and conflict, eight weeks in length. When I look back and I did the mapping on how long it would take me to do each of the wars individually, totaled up would have been 10 total weeks. Mm -hmm. So it was actually two fewer weeks to say, we're going from the Spanish-American War to the present day in this project, and I'm able to cut out two weeks of time that it would have taken me to do it in a much more traditional manner. So that 10% mark is about where I'm going. If it takes me 10 days regularly, I'm OK with 11. If I hit 12, 13, 14, uh-oh, I need to reevaluate. But we have to start with the content. We have to start with the content. We have to start with our standards. What are they? 
How do those pieces then fit into the real world experiences? How do we make it authentic to our students? How, how do we make it relevant to our students? Um, it was really interesting. One of the, the stickies up here said, I would have liked to have seen science in that. Can you think of any ways for those of you that are science teachers, would there be a way to bring science into this project? It was kinetic. Okay. It was kinetic. I said more science. More science. What did he say? They, he said the kinetic. kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. I knew it was, but it just didn't seem like they talked they were, about that. They were focusing the kinetic piece in the tech ed course. So rather than kid, let's, kids, let's all make the pump handle lamp, now let's create something that is kinetic. So I'm sure that there were some lessons on it. I don't know that they went as deep as they could have with the science pieces, though, <laughs> however. So I, I like that you brought that, that particular piece up. This is an expeditionary learning school. They don't call them projects. They call them learning expeditions. And their goal is to create interdisciplinary expeditions. Um, so that's one of the ones. And there are some really great things that have come out of uh, some of the learning expeditionary work that's been done. All right, what I would like to do is to give you an additional example here of significant content. If you read the entire article or if you skimmed the entire article, that was my example of significant content. You can feel free to do that. Um, this really tied in the, the language arts components because they were two language arts um, classes that worked together and they were uh, reading the literature pieces to use the literature pieces as case studies on how to create a disaster plan for their own community, which they then presented to um, a, a panel of the chief of police, the fire chief, um, and different individuals within the community that had you know, big, long-standing things. So the entire project is discussed in that article. Um, they're from White Oak, Texas, and they updated their whole community um, management piece. And at the end of the project, the student said, hey, the one thing we wish we would have done is instead of having those important people come to us, we should have gone out into the community to them to make it more real and more authentic. I was like, wow, a bunch of middle school students said that? That's pretty cool. 21st century skills. What can we talk about 21st century skills? Um, I need to clear up one thing that Ms. Booker and I just learned. Um, <laughs> 21st century skills are communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. It is not technology. The way that they have it written is technology is not a 21st century skill, but it can be incorporated to enhance other skills. So we were kind of, we even put technology up there and just kind of slap it there and we're like, oh, okay, we got to take that down and kind of disperse it. So, um, that's our definition. The evidence is what we found inside um, of the, the video clip, kids doing work together, having the community members come and talk to them, having to communicate with not just other kids, but adults. Um, let's see, connecting it with the real world, talking to city council members. And then the reasoning, students, um, where's our reasoning? Students have ownership. It is their creation, their write-up. They have to communicate their thoughts and how they put this whole thing together. Um, for our current practice, I think we do a really good job with the collaboration and the critical thinking, but I think we really need to do work with our students in talking to outside people, mm -hmm. not just the teacher, and I can kind of fill in the blanks with words that they forget or, or a big, big concept that they don't understand. We can do that because we know them, but when they're communicating with someone that doesn't know them, doesn't know them from Adam or what their project is, I think they have a, 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 a bit of difficulty um, communicating, so I think we can do better with, with just communicating with other adults. Mm -hmm. And we're going to actually do some examples to enhance uh, communication specifically. Yeah. Um, I can't remember if it's, if it's in December or in April, but promise yeah. you that we're going to do some of that. So, you know, and that's a huge misconception, the technology piece. Mm -hmm. I can, and the example that I gave to the ladies was, I can take lecture notes and write them on an overhead and stick it up there. Mm -hmm. I can take those same lecture notes and put it in a PowerPoint and say now it's a 21st century skill. No, it's still the same thing. Um, so we want our students to be thinking of that critical thinking piece, not just the consumers of our significant content, but the producers of new content. Who was the person that said in the quick write um, about the why, why are we doing the same things? Uh, yeah. Why, why are we doing the same things over and over again, right? Can we improve upon something or can we do something new? The communication piece, is it written? Is it oral? Can we communicate in some cases? And, and it might be in art forms 
that's part of communication too, not just having um, the whole STEM piece, but also having the STEAM piece. Um, and then the collaboration. Please do not think that you have to have teamwork, teamwork, teamwork all the time in project-based learning. Throw that idea out the window. You saw individual components within this. When we talk more about assessment, it's great to have those individual pieces when it comes time to assessing, but you can have them collaborate as well and do team pieces. And you can have collaboration without teamwork, right? They can just talk and help each other. You can have different activities that you do in class that would promote that collaboration. You could have students working with experts. That's the one thing that I really personally think this project was lacking. I think that they should have brought in experts into this project. Was it, did I, yeah? Did we talk about that? Yeah, well, bring it in. So bringing in some of those experts, I think if they had some art experts that would have come in and they collaborated with them and when we get to the whole um, the critique and feedback, I think that would have been a great place for it. Um, here's an additional example that I wanted to give you. This is an eighth grade example, I believe. I hope it's not seventh, but it is seventh or eighth. Um, science example, this came out of Holland, Michigan. And what this teacher did was the determination was made that the community was growing too fast and that the output of energy was not going to meet the demands of the community. So her students looked at, you know, how can we create a sustainable energy future for Holland? And they looked at and they investigated all the different types of energy. They had, she said she had students on their own contacting experts from halfway across the world about different things. Um, you know, whether it be geothermal, whether it be, um, you know, nuclear power, wind energy. And then as they came up with and created their final, here's our plan for Holland and what we need to do, then they um, worked with the power plant operator on that and what they felt the, the future needed to be for them. Did they come them. up with consensus and all came down to one idea? Yes, they did do that. And we can talk about how to manage that process because I've done projects like that too. All right, with our driving question, we talked about this last week a little bit. Um, there weren't really any stickers up here, and I heard, well, I wasn't thinking driving question, and I'm not sure if they had a driving question. They talked about two questions in there. I'm not thrilled with the way that the driving question was written. They said, you know, how does art reflect the community, and how does science, math, and engineering um, connect to art? Those were the questions that they used um, to guide the project. For me, I would have written the driving question, how can we create art to reflect our community? That's the way that I would have written it, to have that, because we want that open-ended question. I like the how can we, because it becomes an actionable piece, because we want our students to do that predicting, modeling, forecasting, and developing, so that they potentially could affect change. Now, one of the questions up here was, you know, the students didn't come up with that question. It is okay to start out with more teacher directed when you first embark on project-based learning. It gives us more of a sense of, I, I got this under control, because it's hard to let, let go of control as teachers, right? It's also okay to come up with an overarching question and then let students create their own question out of that. So if I give them this broad overarching question, maybe it's how can we create a more sustainable future um, energy-wise for, for the city of Holland, and then maybe the students create their own question out of that. You know, is wind energy the right one for Holland? You know, how can we promote the use of more renewable resources in Holland so they can kind of hone in on it more? You can also have your students from scratch create a driving question. It becomes much more of an advanced practice. And the first time out into project-based learning, um, it's a little bit more difficult and you need to facilitate that process. So there are different pathways that you can take with that driving question, but to just reiterate last, or two weeks ago, open-ended piece, doesn't matter what the answer is as long as they can justify that process for the driving question. Um, in this case, the driving question for this eighth grade ELA project was how can we support the improvement of literacy in Ugandan children through stories that we write? And it was called Books of Hope. 
And this is a, a teacher out in Petaluma, California. And what they did is they actually created these stories that they sent over to Uganda. But they had a really interesting piece that they had to consider. First and foremost, they had to be written on a level that the students could read. But they had to be written on an interest level for the students <laughs> who were, in some cases, 13 and 14 years old, and they don't want to read a, a babyfied story. And then the third component that they had to consider was what is culturally appropriate to be using in that story as well as they were writing the stories. They read in English? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was, to, help, it was to help them um, to learn English. That was one of the goals. And then we go on to the need to know piece, um, which I like to refer to as simply the entry event. So if we go back to that question on why do, we need, why do we need to learn this, what is this for, how does this connect to me, students are continually asking this. What we want to do is we want to eliminate that and we want to create a need to know for them. In this video, what he used, and we call this an entry event, and later on we will focus more specifically on how to create these entry events. So how do we launch this project? He brought in a sculpture that he made and let the kids say, here's what's wrong with it, right? And that's how he started to get them excited about what this project was. So there are all sorts of different ways that you can do entry events, whether it is bringing in a guest speaker, whether it's taking them out into the back of the school to um, you know, see what's happening um, there. But it needs to be something that will launch and start the inquiry process and we'll look at that in-depth inquiry in just a moment. And it needs to be directly con connected to the driving question itself. So instead of just saying, hey kids, here's a new project, been there, done that, made that mistake, and the kids were like, yeah, right, I don't care that there's another project, Mrs. Lauer. So I needed to do something to bring in their engagement. This example, and it's a little bit dark on the screen there for you, this is a grade 9 through 12 project that was done in uh, Calera, Alabama. Middle of nowhere, Title I school, very little funding, very little money. Um, basically, all the teacher did was he showed a video clip of some third world countries where they were living on very little a day. And he said, how can we use engineering to help make their lives better? And that was their question. And they kind of went down some different pathways. And a group of the students um, in this, what they did, and I don't know if you can tell here or not, um, this is a guy in a wheelchair. And these um, gentlemen have crutches. They're all amputees. And they designed prosthetic legs out of old car parts as their project. Yeah, it's like, wow. Wow, out of old car parts. So they did work with some experts um, in, in doing this, and they were able to raise the money to then um, have them shipped down there. And the students went down themselves, um, and they fitted the amputees with their prosthetic legs. In-depth inquiry. Uh, this table? Yes? Inquiry. Um, what did we say? The definition um, is launched from the driving question that you already talked about. Uh, they compile a list of investigative questions, search for answers to those questions, and ask additional questions to their list after they find the answers to the original list. Um, and they eventually create new solutions or products or ideas. And our evidence, well, what does this say? Um, out in the community looking at art, I think that's how they uh, came up with their original list when they just started looking. Um, researching actual pieces in our city, same thing. And then they brainstormed and implemented their ideas. Uh, and then as far as <coughs> creating their new solutions, what is, this says the students had to build, create, and repair, or fix. Uh, oh, and then they used the Google Maps to make the walking tours. Um, 
Our reasoning was that the final product was created by them um, using their own questions and design and uh, that they had to make, you know, drafts before they got to their final and tweak it and, you know, before they got to their final product. Uh, current practices. <laughs> Not really in depth inqu inquiry, but still inquiry, like we were looking at themes. And so um, we watched the clip of Let It Go from Frozen. And so they each had to come up with their own theme and then look at the lyrics also and figure out how her actions and her lyrics um, apply to their theme. So it's really not a lot of. It's not in depth, but it's still like what what did her actions and what did her lyrics show for the theme? It's kind of shallow, but it's Parker proof. Um, and then research papers, you know, every <laughs> every um, you know every English class does a research paper. Again, um, you do usually you do start with a couple questions when you do a research paper like that. You do start with your driving question. You just may not do um, as much in-depth inquiries until you like get to the 12th grade. Yeah, so really it's kind of like a cycle, right? You remember two weeks ago we came up with some questions. We had a challenge that we were given and we said, well, we need to find out the answers to all of these things to be able to successfully do this challenge. And of course we did it in a much smaller abbreviated format, but as we start a project, we would start with our entry event or our need to know and it would launch the whole process of inquiry. We would give them that driving question and because it's this open-ended question, they should come up with this whole list of new questions that they have to answer in order to be able to successfully um, be able to do the project. <coughs> As they find out the answers to questions, they should come up with new questions and additional questions and more questions and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. It's just like, um, I, I think I gave you the example the last time with the iPhone, right? We didn't stop with the iPhone 1 because we're still going through the inquiry process and saying, okay, what can we make better? How do we make it better? How are the consumers reacting to this? What are the Androids doing that we're not doing? Um, it's a process of inquiry to make things better. So things never end, truly. Obviously in the classroom we have to set a cutoff date because we have different constraints. Um, but that process of inquiry is getting them to ask more questions. We want them to ask more questions and then you can facilitate that process so it's not the coverage of the significant content, but it's the uncoverage of the content through the inquiry process. This particular example, it, it's a fifth grade example and I don't think that anybody that's in here right now is elementary. We had some elementary two weeks ago. Um, but this just stemmed from the fifth graders looking out the window and saying, ooh, what is that yucky stuff? <laughs> Literally, that's how the project started. Because it, they had had some torrential downpours. This was in Frederick, Maryland. And the kids looked outside in the parking lot, um, very urban school, very urban area. And they're like, yuck, what is it? There's all this yucky stuff that's collecting in the parking lot. And so they went through the process of inquiry and what are we going to do about this? What is it? How can we fix it? And they eventually created rain gardens and they even went so far as to create um, uh, some connections between other schools in their area to get some of the other schools to create rain gardens as well. Voice and choice. Who had oh. voice and choice? No. <laughs> Uh, we said the claim, uh, the students were given the option to create their own project, and the evidence, I mean, there was, you know, typical evidence there, it was, you know, having a hands-on project, uh, the students being able to take care of their own learning, um, that they were able to create their own sculptures, and uh, the teacher didn't necessarily have, like, a manual for them, but instead they, you know, were told to kind of go out on their own. Um, and then for the reasoning, we said that they're creating their own project and taking ownership of their own learning. And in our current practice, we came up uh, with probably the big one, the capstone project that we work on every year. You know about it? 
I have heard bits and pieces from uh, Michelle. She talked to me a little bit about that. So voice and choice. All right. If you're told to do something, you will do this. Do you necessarily want to do it all the time? Right? You know you have to have continuing ed credits, but you got an option of how you wanted to get those. So I'm assuming you all had the voice and the choice to come here, right, for project-based learning. Uh, because then it becomes more of an ownership piece for us. And if we take an ownership in our learning, we'll see that the students <coughs> put forth more effort. There is nothing wrong with having requirements. You want to have requirements, you can have requirements. You can say, you will all create a kinetic sculpture, but I have 80 different sculptures that have shown up in the front of my room because you took different pathways to get there and a different design. So we want that ownership piece. My, my six-year-old, when we said, you can pick the color to paint your room, we went from, I mean, I almost had a heart attack when I saw the color of pink, but we went from messy, messy room to it is perfectly clean because now she has ownership in it. She picked the color of her room and it worked. So that's a huge thing with the students. It could be them creating the project from start to finish. In some cases, if they're ready for that level, in some instances, it may be more of um, having them come up with their own design through the process with your requirements. This particular one here, um, it is a high school level one that the students, um, it was a combination of science, math, and um, ELA as well in this particular class, and this was in Georgia. And what they did was they went down to visit a fifth grade classroom. And the fifth graders said, we want our classroom redesigned. And they interviewed the students and said, what do you want? Let's make it your classroom for what you want, for how you think you will best learn. And from those interviews then, the uh, 10th and 11th grade students then designed for them what they wanted and they were able to, um, they went and they built the different learning stations and the tables and the, we need this to move and we want that to move um, for the students. So the fifth graders had voice and choice in what they wanted for their learning environments and then the 11th, uh, 10th and 11th graders had the, the voice and choice and how it was created. Now we have critique and feedback. Um, critique and feedback, our definition. Students continually reflect on the um, driving question. The inquiry process actively engages. Uh, they're actively engaged in reflection and revision in order to fully understand. Our evidence is that the students were given feedback at the end of the presentation where they had the community members there. Um, people were able to critique their art. Um, uh, by logging onto their websites and uh, critique each other's um, to see the process. The reasoning students had to critique themselves, each other, and the teachers, um, they, to start, they were able to tell the teacher what was right or what was wrong about his um, project. Um, our current practice, um, I can really improve in this area because I usually do um, critiques, we usually go over rubrics, um, but you know, it, it's usually after the project is done. So in terms of my current practice, I could probably improve upon it. And I found that the students are more critical of each other than I am mm -hmm. uh, of, of them. Yeah, so the Buck Institute actually did their own um, reflection. They used to call that element reflection and revision. So if you see reflection and revision written, that was the original element. They have since renamed it to critique and feedback. They may change it again at some point. I like it as a combination of both. I think we need to reflect and revise once we get the critique and feedback um, because then we need to actually put it into to place and we need to build those processes into the project itself because what the project looks like on day one should look very different on day five, should look very different on day 10 or however many days that you spend on it. And this picture is something that I took when I walked into a school um, just outside of Richmond, Virginia last summer. And I don't know if you can clearly see the before picture, um, but this is the before and the after picture, the first self-portrait that she did and then the after. Like, 
that's my problem with drawing. I never got critique and feedback to make it improved because my picture wouldn't even look like the before. It's the stick figure, right? So all of that critique that they get and the feedback will cause them to reflect and revise. And so I should be incorporating enough of this into the process so that there are no surprises at the end, so that I'm able to build in any of the scaffolds that I need for each of my students to meet their learning where they are on that level of complexity. And so that at the end of the process, you know, it's something that they are proud of and it's something that is truly ready for our public audience, which is our next element. This one, I, I always show this no matter what grade level I'm talking about. This is actually a kindergarten project. And it's a Rube Goldberg machine, if you couldn't tell what it was. So these, these fifth, or kindergarten students who are five years old for the most part, they worked with engineering students from Southern Methodist University on this project. So they were looking at force and motion and gravity and all of these things and trying to figure out what to do. And as they received um, multiple levels of critique and feedback, from the engineering students at the university, then they were ultimately able to create these pretty phenomenal Rube Goldberg machines that were amazing for five-year-olds to put together and to do. So now we have, um, and what I really like about the project too is we're looking at a lot of girls that are doing the project too at five years of age. So getting girls very excited about some engineering concepts at a young age, I think is just fabulous. And to have them work with engineering students that are much older than them. So as a five-year-old, now I'm able to communicate, I'm able to collaborate, I'm able to work with, I'm able to listen to feedback, and I'm able to improve upon that. Um, as five years of age is just an amazing story. And then we get to public audience. Okay, the really funny thing is we didn't follow the directions because we, we couldn't access the article on this computer because it wanted a Adobe Reader installed or something. So we just went along with what we could do and totally forgot the assignment. And so um, she just crammed and looked up the definition, but we did get some good information. Um, the definition of public audience is taking the project to a higher level of professionalism puts students in a situation where they use those 21st century skills of communication. So see what I would have learned if I'd read that? Um, <laughs> so all we had was these ideas, but in different ways, of course, because we wouldn't copy directly. That would be plagiarism. So our evidence for this is that um, they developed a relationship with the community and public leaders. That was done through the letters and other sources. Um, the presentations move them beyond the classroom, and then those presentations um, and the conversation was critiqued by the community experts, also, of course, their problem. And then finally, um, community members voted, so they actually selected one to be built in the community on assuming. It really happened. Um, as for my practice, hmm. Uh, when it comes to capstone, um, it's a history lesson for me, so I'm having a little trouble getting to the current day from the history, the essence of the history, but I know there are lots and lots of connections. How does the history impact what's Today. currently happening? Yeah, yeah, and I know what did happen too in history. It's westward expansion. So I know what happened as well, but you know, she and I are both <coughs> teaching kids with multiple disabilities, <laughs> but listening over here to your group talk and um, thinking about where I can improve this you know, not assuming my kids can't do it. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if you want to share on what you're doing or anything. She's capstone too. And you know, even looking at it, the kids with multiple disabilities, I, I go back to Wayne, my sweet little Wayne, who was 17 years old that read at a first grade level that was in a life skills classroom. And Wayne would be in his bow tie and he would be presenting in front of professionals within the community and it was on his level of complexity and it may have taken I, I remember distinctly it taking him two full 80 minute class periods to figure out the number of individuals male and female population within the prison system in our county because he couldn't even multiply it out I mean it was one, two, three, four, five, and it was a very long process for him, 
but he was able to eventually get up there and do that presentation and he was so proud of himself and what he was able to do with that. And so that public audience piece is key. We saw them writing the letters to the mayor. That's a way to have a public audience. You can send something out. We saw the public audience with the Google walking tour, something that is on the web with a very defined purpose, not just let me slap this up on TeacherTube and hope that somebody stumbles across it. It has to have a definitive purpose. We saw them doing the exposition where the community members came in and they did some voting. I'm the first to admit I never did community ex exhibitions because I didn't want to plan them. Just didn't want to do it, right? I didn't want to drive 17 miles home and then drive 17 miles back to have this big community exhibition. It wasn't me. There were a lot of different teachers in our school that wanted to go that route, and that was great. As long as it's more than just let me stand beside of my project, but let me actually have that interaction with you as the community member. So there's lots of different ways that you can do that. You can have and bring in experts to do a panel presentation if you want to go that route. It's obviously good for their communication skills to have them be able to do that. So that, that public audience is key. This is a group of students that were um, faced with the challenges from the community where the community came to them and said, here are our problems, here are our issues, this is we want, what we want you to help us fix. We're the United Way, we have enough of food, we can't distribute it. We've got logistical problems with distribution. We have, um, we have a major uh, company in our community, Herman Miller. We can't keep the people in the community. They wanna leave the community, they graduate, they go off to school, and they don't come back to work for us. How can we bring people back um, community members back to work for us. So the community came to them and said, what is the issue? And then they actually presented to um, those community members and this kid's holding a check. Um, they got scholarship money for it. They were so impressed, they gave them some scholarship money, the, the partnerships within the community, which is amazing. And I just wanted to share a particular story with you um, from my own classroom that shows the power of the public audience. I had um, my law students look at how can we reduce crime in our county? Right? They came up with their own driving question from that um, to narrow down some different things. And ultimately, they presented to a panel of approximately seven people. I had uh, you know, a judge, I had um, our district attorney, we had um, our state representative, had some police officers, some different people on there. And in the presentation, we're in the middle of the presentation, and I had the state representative stand up and he started doing this in the face, I know, right? In the face of the district attorney saying, you tell me why, you tell me why we are at the bottom of the state in this category and you haven't done anything to change it and why I have a group of 17 and 18 year olds that have brought it to my attention. And my kids are going, what did we just do? What did we just do? And I'm like, this is great. This is great. You know, I mean, it was the finger pointing. It was a very tense moment, very tense moment. Um, and same project, fast forward a couple of semesters, exact same project, very different ideas from the students, a different presentation altogether. Um, some of the panelists were the same. Some of the panelists were different. Um, but what happened was the morning of the presentation, um, one of the students came in and said, hey, Mrs. Lauer, I want to tweak some things. And I used to make my students um, only use Web 2.0 tools. I said, no PowerPoint, because it didn't look like this. It was 96 words on a slide, and they just turned their back and they read the 96 words, right? So I said, no PowerPoint. Lesson learned for me, because that morning, the internet went down. And it was not, it was not the school's fault, it was Comcast's fault. And so they were, like, okay, what are we gonna do? And I said, uh, it's, all, it's all right. Presentation's at 9, 10, it's 7.30. It'll have to be up and running by then. Not a problem. 9.05, the bell rings. My panelists are walking in, including my superintendent who says to me, hey, Dana, I heard about the issue. It's okay, we can come back tomorrow. I said, you can come back tomorrow. They can't come back tomorrow. <laughs> And my students are walking in, they have their suits on, their dresses on, there were no cracks up here, there were no cracks down here, it was beautiful. And they're like, it's okay, Mrs. Lauer, we got this, we got this. 
And for the next 45 minutes, I sat in the back of the room and I cried mm -hmm. because they went through a flawless presentation because somebody had saved charts and graphs as JPEGs. And you would have never known that their presentation was somewhere out there on the web and inaccessible. And it was amazing. It was amazing what they did. If it wasn't for that audience, it would have been like, <laughs> so Mrs. Lauer, um, do you think we can watch a movie today, right? Internet's not working, can't do the presentation. And we've all seen presentations where we want to do this, right? So it's about making it real, it's about making it authentic, it's about making it complex. So those are eight essential elements. I am going to challenge you between now and December to do a couple of things. You're like, oh, homework, great. <laughs> First challenge is think about what those authentic connections are, relevant connections to your curriculum and to what's happening around us. It could be your school community, your local community. It could be the state of Ohio. It could be the national government. It could be the global issues. But as long as you can make it real and you can make it relevant to them, think about where do your curriculum connections tie in. The next challenge is then, I want you to pick at least one of those eight essential elements and I want you to work on it, okay? If you want to work on all eight, because you are just that enthusiastic about all eight elements, you can work on all eight. But I want you to pick at least one to work on it. 